you who may not be <coughs> familiar with the work of AP, um, here is our flagship book that has lessons that are designed to be used in classes, in churches, and that's kind of a summary of the whole area of Christian evidences. And then we have uh, a trilogy that we've put out, one on the inspiration of the Bible, one on the deity of Christ, and then we just redid the third one and retitled it, Does God Exist? So that uh, is right along the line of our subject matter. And then a number of other books, if you're not aware, that can be accessed uh, at our website. And a lot of this stuff is free if you don't buy it in a prepackaged form. The material is there on the site uh, that you can access it. I wanted to mention to you also a book that will be coming out uh, within the next two months that I think especially the students and preachers uh, will be interested in accessing. All right, what do we mean by the teleological argument? Well, we certainly want to answer the question, can we know that God exists? And you well know that Christians firmly and forcefully say, absolutely. That's not a matter of, well, I think, I wish, I hope. No, this is a matter of knowledge with us. And that's exactly how the Bible presents the matter. A number of classical arguments have been formulated over the centuries by people who embraced uh, Christian values and they uh, came up with these high dollar terms to name them. Uh, but the one that we're looking at today is the teleological. In my opinion, none of these arguments have been answered. They stand firm as proof positive that the God of the Bible exists. Where does this term come from? Well, the Greek word telos means end, purpose, or go. So the teleological argument is presenting information that shows, that pinpoints, points out the fact that the universe and the entire created order has purpose. It, it was clearly designed. It, it has, each, each aspect of it has intention and end or goal uh, as part of it. So the universe is orderly, complex, and intricate. The design in the universe had to have a designer, a master architect, and planner. In fact, the nature of the universe is such that we not only know that the Creator exists, we know quite a bit about him before we ever even open our Bibles. Uh, you remember Paul stated that in Romans 1, certain things you can know because it indicates these attributes that this uh, creator uh, possesses. And here's the passage we want to key off of in our session today. There are other passages that affirm teleology in the New Testament, Roman, Roman, uh, Acts 14, Psalm 19, and others. Uh, but notice that what may be known of God is manifested in or to them. God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. There are two of his attributes right off the bat. Three, really, his eternality, his omnipotence, and his divinity are evident from the created order. You can't look at the sky and the created order and, and know that you have to be baptized or that Jesus died for your sins or was resurrected. That has to be given by special revelation. But this provides the platform from which we commence our consideration of Scripture. All right, let's look at these uh, four terms, the things that are made. Notice this passage then is telling us uh, we as Christians have uh, a right, a privilege, and perhaps even an obligation to examine the things that are made in order to draw the right conclusion that there is a God. And really, all human beings on the planet are obligated to do that. And if they fail to do it, they're without excuse, Paul said. All right, so let me take you through some of, some of these. Uh, you know, you could spend multiple lifetimes looking at the evidence. Look how much time people are spending doing things that are not very worthwhile. Uh, just looking at the universe itself, looking at the earth itself, the way, it was, the way it functions, the way it operates. All of this indicates planning. And then, of course, uh, the plants on the, on the planet, the animals, and then our bodies. You know, you could spend your whole life just studying the human brain as many people have, and haven't even begun to access um, full understanding of its operation. Well, that, that indicates a higher mind uh, that is behind this. All right, let's look, look at some of the things that are made that, in my opinion, any one of these proves God. You know, it's case closed, it's done. How about this uh, bacterial cell, salmonella, which, you know, is a deadly um, cell. Here it has uh, a cellular body. It has several 
flagellar filaments, flagella, each one of them rotating synch synchronously at two to three hundred cycles per second in order for it to propel itself. Now look at the, where it is attached at the cell body. As you look beneath the surface membrane, you can see what is clearly an engine. An engine. And the little section that connects the engine to the flagellar filament is uh, essentially a universal joint, is what we would call it in our uh, understanding of mechanical uh, features. Now, if you were uh, walking through the woods and you came across this uh, object, uh, without ever knowing that there was somebody who made that, you'd be forced to conclude this just didn't happen. This is loaded with complexity and design and intention, all of it intending to function together. Here's what it actually looks like under, uh, I think, electron microscope. Now let me show you some of the details of this thing, and you tell me if this was created. Um, it forms this uh, flagellum by creating this, this motor. And uh, scientists have names for all of this. You know, there's a C-ring that's on the other side of the cytoplasm, and um, as it constructs itself, see again, there's intention here going on. This had to be planned and orchestrated. It sends these proteins up from the cell body in order to start growing this uh, flagellum uh, filament. Once that's done then, it forms that universal joint, the hook as it's called, which then takes it outside of the, the cell body itself. Then these very specific proteins begin to operate and form kind of a capping structure so that uh, it can begin to grow this filament. Now look at these little um, proteins that come out and then the flagella molecules are able to come up through the shaft and notice how this capping structure shifts itself in order for them to come out and take their proper location. Look at the, look at the intricacy of this, the design, the intention. Uh-oh, somebody plug that in for me. Notice that man-made things, which require intention and design, are nevertheless inferior to what God did. All right, there's a polymerization taking place at the growing end as it continues to grow. And this, this just continues. It's like a, a fast-moving machine that knows exactly what's uh, taking place, although there's no mind inside of this structure. It's not sentient. 20 to 30,000 flagella molecules polymerize to build a 10 to 15 micrometer long filament. And it grows several of these out of the cell body. In order to generate thrust and propel itself. This is similar to man-made motors because humans get their designs oftentimes from nature. The flagellum is attached, as we said, to this rotor that has stator units, switching unit, bushing, universal joint, helical screw propeller, and other features. And notice it works like it's uh, intended to function smoothly and efficiently. It rotates at 20,000 RPMs. That's faster than the speed of Formula One race cars. Uh, energy consumption uh, near zero and energy conversion efficiency close to 100%. Humans, with all of their intention and examination, have not been able to produce this uh, functional uh, machine, really. Far beyond the capability of artificial motors, uh, so sophisticated to suggest that it evolved is the height of irrationality and blind prejudice. But there's a lot of people in the world that draw that conclusion. But their prejudice should not be a mitigating factor in our confident faith and belief in the God of the Bible who created this incredible machine. A cheetah can move about 25 of its own body lengths in one second. This bacteria can move 10. Highly efficient, tremendously capable. 
Here's a fascinating feature of uh, the created order, and there's so much of this that you and I are oblivious to. We've just never paid any attention. We go on our merry way and live our lives, but I'm telling you, God has surrounded us with evidence of his existence. If you're a squeak about cockroaches, you might want to close your eyes. <laughs> Ampulex compressa, the emerald cockroach wasp, and then the American cockroach, which is six times the size of the emerald wasp. What this wasp does, specifically designed, notice this could not have evolved. It is specifically designed to prey upon cockroaches. And it does it in a more fascinating, effective fashion than raid. The first thing he does is he enacts this brilliantly strategic sting into the central nervous system of the cockroach, which causes a temporary paralysis of the front leg so that it cannot get away. Kind of gruesome, and yet, remember, this came out of the mind of God. Now, you would think that he's killing this cockroach, but he is not. Sting number two. This allows him to enact a second sting that's in a very carefully chosen spot in the brain ganglia which then completely immobilizes and removes his desire to flee, his escape reflex. The brain sting causes a dramatic behavioral change. The cockroach becomes passive, zombie-like, its breathing slows, and it makes no attempt to escape. Again, if you come upon this cockroach, you think, wow, it's dying. No, it's not. As a result of this sting, the roach will groom itself, become sluggish, and fail to show normal escape responses. The wasp then takes a hold of the cockroach's antenna, using them as leashes, and proceeds to lead the cockroach to the wasp's burrow. The wasp, or the uh, cockroach, shows no resistance and, in fact, moves his legs to assist in his transfer from the location where he was stung to the burrow where the, uh, emerald, cock, uh, where the emerald wasp is wanting to take him. Astounding. This is a relationship that was designed strategically by God. Now, once he gets him to the burrow, the wasp lays a white egg about two millimeters long on the roach's abdomen, and then he exits the burrow and begins to shove debris into the burrow to barricade this uh, cockroach, uh, not for the purpose of keeping him inside the burrow, but to keep predators out. With its escape reflex disabled, the stung roach will stay calm and complacent, and uh, the egg uh, grows for about three days and then hatches. The hatch larvae then drill a hole into the leg of the cockroach to retrieve nutrition from the blood system. That goes on for four to five days. Then the larva burrows into the abdomen of the cockroach, crawls inside over a period of eight days, consumes the roach's internal organs in an order which guarantees that the roach will stay alive at least until the larvae enter the pupal stage and form a cocoon inside the cockroach's body. Six weeks from the first sting, a new adult wasp emerges from the hollowed out dead roach. There's no way this evolved. This is detailed complexity that clearly forces the logical, rational, unbiased, unprejudiced mind to conclude somebody designed that. Somebody made that to operate the way it does. Wasp venom is carefully calibrated to shut down signals. See, how would the wasp venom evolve? What's going to happen until it evolves? It is capable of uh, shutting down signals carried by a key neurotransmitter brain chemical called dopamine. The wasp delivers the sting with the precision of microscopic brain surgery. And of course, we all know that's because he went to medical school. This skill did not evolve, it wasn't learned, it was hardwired by the creator into each wasp, making it a natural born neurosurgeon. The offspring of the wasp literally depends on the perfect execution of the mother sting. Too much venom, the cockroach dies. And so the species dies. The, uh, if the, the venom is too little or poorly aimed, the, the roach gets away. This all has to be perfect. 
and it is. Millions of years of trial and error cannot be the source of this relationship. Failure of any one step in this complex process would prevent reproduction and terminate the species. The emerald wasp and the American cockroach were created by the creator to function precisely as they do. That makes number of passages more meaningful to us. The more you scan and examine and study the created order, O oh Lord, how manifest are, are manifold are your works and wisdom. You have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. We don't even know how many creatures in all of them. They're constantly discovering new species. Here's the lodgepole pine. The shaded portion of the map shows you uh, where this species of pine tree uh, is situated. Uh, its pine cones, like many trees, do not open at maturity because there's a resinous bond that holds all of the, the cone scales, which are the seeds, uh, in place. Well, what does it take for them to release a forest fire? It's specifically designed to produce seeds for replanting, which do not occur until a forest fire occurs, which then enables the species to perpetuate itself. So I'm confident there was a, a, a gathering in the forest one day of, of these pine trees, and they said, look, we're going to do something. We're all going to burn up. I think we can get some glue to kind of hold our seeds until a fire is over, and then we can replant, maybe? This is Yellowstone, had a fire in 1988. This picture was taken 10 years later. You can see the impact is completely refurbishing itself. You know when the environmentalists and all these people, politicians, and all the harp at us and fuss and all that about the environment, men are not going to be able to destroy the world. I do believe in global warming because it's described in 2 Peter 3, but God will be the author of that. <laughs> in the meantime, his created order is resilient, and it will last for just as long as he intended it to. That's where the atheists and environmentalists are off base. They think this is an eternal realm. We've got to, it's up to us to preserve and protect it. No, it's not. God's got it operating, doing what he wants it to do until he's ready to put it into its purpose. And its purpose, of course, is to provide human beings with a place where they can determine their eternal destiny. This is a beetle species from Southeast Asia. Uh, researchers have been examining it for some time because of its unusual brilliance, its whiteness. Um, its body, head, and legs are covered with long, flat scales. The size and spacing of these scales are such that they scatter white light far better than the fibers in the best or the brightest white paper that humans have been able to uh, generate. The scales are only one two hundredth of a millimeter thick, ten times thinner uh, than a human hair, far thinner than the coatings and paints that are used on paper and plastics. In fact, man-made coatings would have to be twice as thick in order to be as white as the surface of this beetle. Brilliant scientists hoping to mimic the design of the beetle. Uh, of course, this beetle did not attend a university or study physics or create itself, and yet it has something to teach these smart men about optical brilliance. The fascinating complex design of the beetle points to a master designer. There's no other possible explanation. Well, no wonder then the Bible says that God made everything, including all those little creeping, crawly things that uh, crawl upon the earth. What about Psalm 148? Let them praise the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And among those are creeping things and flying fowl. That's where they came from. Not from evolutionary processes and mindless, mechanistic forces of nature. In uh, the week of creation, creation week, you remember God made the statement regarding seed. When you look at these verses, it, it becomes apparent that seed is pretty critical to the creation. He spends time talking about its necessity and its function in uh, perpetuating the various species on the planet. Well, guess what? More proof for God. Let's just look at one aspect. God designed various mechanisms by which seed could be dispersed on the planet. Uh, certainly animals, you know, for example, a bird eats uh, from a piece of fruit on a tree, uh, consumes the seeds, flies to another location, the seeds pass through its body, and there that, that fruit is planted at that location. And this is just so complex, it's going on constantly all over the world. What about uh, the use of water to shift? Look what this hurricane is doing. It's going to shift seed even from islands out 
in the uh, Atlantic Ocean to our country. All of this designed by God to function. What about the use of the wind? This is a major means by which God disperses seed and tends for the planet to reseed itself. Notice, without the help of man. It's not our, we don't have to go out and worry about this. Reminds me of how God said to Job so many times, you know, you know if I turn over the reproduction cycle of the lion with all of its cubs, you're going to be able to handle this? Notice how this is an aerodynamically designed feature of the created order. And I know that you love... Uh, dandelions. You love your yard to be filled with them. Here's how it happens. It has a shaft with a single seed at the bottom and clearly a canopy of finely, uh, fine thin hairs. This thing is specifically designed where the length of the shaft is just right. If it were shorter or too long it would not function aerodynamically like it does. So it's specifically made in one, you know, one dandelion has several of these. The wind catches that canopy, pulls it loose, and then takes it by wind to another location where it can be reseeded. The Eurasian dandelion. Dandelion is absolute and undeniable proof of God. Imagine going into you know, Yale University uh, science classroom where the teacher's an atheist and most of the students are an atheist and a Christian walks in there with his hand like this. He says, I have absolute proof that the Creator exists in my hand. Open that up, show one of those. What could they say? Did they come up with some concocted, convoluted way that these seeds formed and connected itself to a little plant, which then reseeds itself and creates many more? To do that would be to deny the obvious out of personal prejudice and pride. Now that's the case then with a lot of seed. Look at uh, this chart of various types of seed that are specifically designed uh, to float with the wind. Uh, for example, look at this one that grows here in the United States. Here is a seed beneath the sheath. And it has connected to it, or as part of it, this fan-shaped wing. You think this just came about accidentally? When it's designed to fly. How long did it take for humans to come up with shafts that could be used as rotor blades or whatever in order to sort out this concept of flying? Here's a kind of fruit seed in Thailand. They call it uh, spinning fruit or the whirling nut. I'll show you uh, some of these in just a moment. But look at this one. This is in the Malay archipelago um, in the Sunda Islands. A single seed encased in papery thin wings. Just look at that. Without even knowing anything about it, you look at it and the shape of it. This, this is designed to function. And function, it does. Uh, they're in these gourds that hang from a vine high in the forest canopy. When they're released, they become gliders in order to reseed the, the plant. And constantly they function aerodynamically. Through the miracle of YouTube, we are able to see these vines and these gourds. And at the proper time, notice all of this is designed by God, even in terms of timing. These gourds that are packed with these seeds, they begin dropping out. Now, you're walking through the forest one day. You look up and you see this. What would you think immediately? Well, you might first think this is some sort of an animal, you know, a big butterfly or something. And then you look closer and it's not. And then you find out, well, that black spot, that's a seed. Well, what's it doing? It's moving away from the vine in order to reseed itself. This is all intention intellectual sophistication. That's a true glider. How long did it take for humans to even notice they didn't invent anything, they simply came to understand the aerodynamic principles that God himself created. Thrust and uh, lift and all of those uh, working together. Here is that uh, seed that I showed you a moment ago where notice it doesn't have what we would think of it have two wings. It has one. But it is so designed that it functions in, uh, by flying, even with that single. And here's one of the spinning. Again, you see that coming down? Spinning like that? Accident? This just accidentally came about? The very notion is uh, absurd. 
If you've ever been uh, in an area where these are dropping from a tree and you go up and look at them closely and see how they're flying, kids are fascinated by them because they can see. You know, this, this shows intention. This is like something I'd buy at Walmart in order to take home and, and let it fly. Divine design. No wonder then Isaiah said that uh, God planned all of this seed to function but, you know, the real seed is the Word of God. If the seed that exists out here in the created environment is fascinating and points to the Creator, imagine what uh, uh, the Word of God does. The Ponderosa pine, a large stand of these in my uh, birth state, home state of Arizona, up in northern, long, uh, on the Muggian Rim. These massive uh, trees have bark that look like jigsaw puzzles. When you come up and look at it closely, the bark stands out from the tree, like somebody took these jigsaw pieces and put some glue and stuck it on the tree. Well, that's design. They are literally designed when they catch fire to pop off of the tree. Once again, there must have been a, a gathering of ponderosa pines who somebody thought, one of the trees thought up this way to preserve uh, their resistance to low intensity fires by shedding its bark. Absolutely astounding. See, this just goes on and on. How many of you uh, remember when the USDA told us that uh, you should throw away all of your wood cutting boards because uh, if you have those near food, salmonella and stuff gets in there and you can contaminate your food. So get rid of those and use plastic because, you know, men created plastic and we know it's superior. The best research denies that. I spoke with Dr. Dean Cliver, who at the time was at, the, at UC Davis, spending years studying this, uh, what he called the antibacterial property of wood. Okay, had a team of researchers working with him, and after several years of research, they uh, discovered that there is something going on here that we don't fully understand. What he did was he took five life-threatening bacteria, E. coli, salmonella, you know, listeria, staph. He uh, implanted these on four plastic polymers and on 10 species of hardwood, which included these uh, seven that I've listed for you. And here's uh, what they determined. Within three minutes of inoculating wooden boards with cultures of the food poisoning agents, 99.9% .9 of the bacteria became unrecoverable, that was his terminology. He didn't say they died, he just said they were no longer able to be accessed. None of the bacteria plastic died. In fact, uh, leaving those uh, populations on those two surfaces overnight, uh, you know, on the plastic boards, the microbial uh, the salmonella and stuff grew and increased. But the next morning, None of the bacteria was recoverable from the wood. Bacterial, what, here's what he thinks was going on. Bacteria is absorbed into the wood. The wood fibers pull the, this deadly uh, bacteria down into the wood itself uh, where they not only can't multiply, but rarely, if ever, come back. But bacteria in knife scars and plastic boards remain viable even after you've used a hot water soap wash. By the way, after I preached this some years ago, my daughter-in-law went home and threw away all the plastic boards and got a big, just a two before and put it, put it on her cabinet. <laughs> yeah. And notice that when we try to treat the wood, you know, with varnish and things, we are retarding its natural antibacterial property. Isn't that fascinating? Microbiologists remain mystified by their inability to isolate a mechanism or agent responsible for these antibacterial properties. Well, this came from God. It's a God-divine designed feature. You know, that makes this um, legislation in the um, Law of Moses spring to life. Whenever the Israelites uh, had a discharge or something that contaminated one of their dishes that was pottery or clay or whatever that they had made, they were just to break it and discard it. But if they uh, got it on a wood bowl, they were simply to rinse it and it could be reused. How do you explain that? 
Moses didn't understand the antibacterial properties of wood, but God gave him that information. Symbiosis proves God. What is symbiosis? A close, usually obligatory association of two or more plants or animals of different species that depend on each other to survive. Each gains benefits from the other, and both each needs the other to survive. There are different levels of to what extent. Some of them, like the yucca moth, will die if it doesn't have a yucca plant, period. There's no alternative means for its per perpetuation. Well, this is proof of God. This, this could not have happened by evolutionary so uh, forces over multiplied millions of years. They try to explain it, but when you look at it and read it, it's gobbledygook. It, it doesn't answer the day-to-day -day, uh, sequence that would have had to have occurred. Take, for example, uh, the only known home of the dodo bird which is uh, Mauritius, which is off the uh, southeast uh, coast of Africa. These were first sighted by Europeans around 1600, but within about 80 years, uh, the dodo bird went extinct. This is the uh, Tambula coca tree, which grows on that island. In 1973, it became apparent to the local foresters that this tree was going extinct. In fact, uh, there were only 13 left, and they were sickly. The experienced Mauritian foresters uh, tried to do all they knew to do. Uh, they, they felt like uh, the remaining trees were ancient, you know, more than 300 years old, but they, um, they simply could not get the seeds to germinate. They tried to do it in carefully tended nursery conditions, but it was not happening. So they consulted an American wildlife ecologist, um, <clears throat> which I contacted and spoke to personally. In order to verify and clarify this, Dr. Temple at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he has since retired. Here's his actual article in Science Magazine in 1977. And uh, in this article, he explains the sequence of events, how this came about. He, he figured, you know, if these trees, the remaining trees are about 300 years old, then something happened in, in its environment 300 years ago that would account for this sudden a change that is bringing about their extinction. Well, uh, the dodo bird was extinct by 1681. And so he's thinking, okay, maybe that had something to do with this. He went back and checked records. There weren't a lot of records, but uh, they did uh, indicate that the dodo birds were known for feeding on fruit and seed. The uh, seed of a tambula coca tree is enclosed within a hard, thick endocarp covered by a pulpy succulent mesocarp and then a thin exocarp. Looks similar to uh, an avocado. Temple knew that some seeds need the processing of animals, uh, of the internal organs of animals in order to process the seeds so that it would function properly. The grinding of a bird, big bird's gizzard can erode just the proper amount of the hard pit so that the seed within passing out of the digestive system uncrushed can sprout and take root in the soil. So how could he test his theory? There are no dodo birds, all gone. So he reasoned, well, there's one bird that's uh, known as being as dumb as a dodo, and that would be a turkey. <laughs> so he enlisted a flock of turkeys, and sure enough, some of the pits made it through, ground down by the turkey's gizzards, and a few sprouted into healthy infant tamblacoga trees, perhaps the first seen on the island in three centuries. So the dodo bird received sustenance by eating the seeds and leaves of the tree. The tree was perpetuated by the bird's gizzard scratching its seeds as they passed through the digestive system. That is a symbiotic relationship. By the way, notice that proves also that the days of Genesis 1 were normal days. There are so many species, animals, plants, insects, all over the planet that depend upon each other for survival. They could not have been separated by creation by millions of years. They had to have come into existence in close temporal time uh, with each other. But it also proves a master designer. There is a God. Here is the uh, largest African crocodile. Can reach uh, up to 1,600 plus pounds. Eats mainly fish, but it, it will attack almost anything. Zebras, small hippos, birds, porcupines, other crocs, and of course, humans. These uh, massive creatures are ambush hunters. They'll wait for fish or land animals to come close, then they just suddenly rush out to attack. Vicious man-eaters, up to 200 people die each year in the jaws of a Nile croc. 
the Nile crocodile. Now here's the Egyptian plover bird. There was a uh, World War I British um, intelligence officer who wrote a book on the habits of uh, predatory birds back uh, in the 50s. And he describes the behavior of this bird. Uh, read it with me. North of Khartoum, I watched a large crocodile emerging from the river to a sandbank, flop down on its belly, close its eyes, open its jaws. Three pluvianus, that's the scientific term for these birds, who had been feeding nearby at once flew to it, one perching on the outer gums and pecking at the teeth, the other two remaining on the ground and inspecting the mouth, occasionally reaching up and pecking the teeth. I could not say what was extracted in, uh, by the birds, and the whole episode looked as though the crocodile expected and invited the birds. And the birds were quite at home inspecting the inside of the mouth of the crocodile. Well, what they, what they were doing was removing parasites, leeches, old food, in order to uh, improve the uh, oral health of the crocodile. So they're, they're God's dentists. <laughs> Look how long it took for humans to realize they need to take care of their teeth. They still have it in England, as I understand it. But <clears throat> here is uh, an ancient version of the Quarterly Journal of Ornithology that I was able to uncover. This fellow tells about how uh, he and another fellow went down uh, to inspect this very same uh, process and he describes in detail uh, how they, he, he watched patiently and these two large crocodiles come out and a act as if they're there to bask in the sun and these birds suddenly start flitting and then they, of course, began to go inside. It looks like the crocodile's asleep. You know, he closes his eyes, but he opens his mouth. And these birds go in there. He closes his mouth on the birds. And about a minute later, he opens. The bird comes out, goes over, and spits something into the water, comes back, the same process occurs again. Well, what's going on here? This is a symbiotic relationship that could only have been designed by God. Both are benefiting. And again, uh, there's no crocodile that would ever, you know, think, hey, we need to do this uh, in order to preserve our oral health. If they didn't get together and think through that, it all took place because of a master designer and creator. This arrangement could not have evolved. It had to come about by divine design. No wonder then Job said, ask the beasts, they'll tell you. The birds of the air, they will tell you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Sir uh, James Jeans was a uh, British physicist, astronomer, mathematician. He taught at both Cambridge and uh, at Princeton, earned the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, knighted by the Queen. In fact, one of the craters on the moon is named after him. So he was a, you know, a brilliant uh, scientist in his day, way back in early uh, 20th century. In his book, The Mysterious Universe, look what he admits. We discover that the universe shows, look at the term, evidence of a designing or controlling power that has something in common with our individual minds. Genesis 126, we're made in the image of God. Not so far as we have discovered emotion, morality, or aesthetic appreciation, but the tendency to think in the way which, for want of a better word, we describe as mathematical. So the universe appears to have been designed by a power that has mathematical properties, organized, complex, intricate thinking patterns. Now that's an honest man. That's an honest man. And atheists who deny the evidence and the truth are, for whatever reason, dishonest or um, <clears throat> prejudiced. Now notice I've only shown you a handful of these. The planet is literally loaded with billions of these kinds of features of the created realm, the realm of nature. There's no sentience there. No tree has intelligence or consciousness, no creative capability. None of them create themselves. 
There has to be then a mind outside of them that organized, designed, and created them. Their complex, intricate, rational, purposive, marvelous design demands an all-powerful, all-knowing, infinite God, and only the God of the Bible fits the uh, explanation of what we see on the planet. None of the Hindu gods do. None of the gods of uh, Greek mythology and the like. All right, we close with this statement from Psalm 104. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you've made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here's the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures, innumerable, living things both small and great. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. The Bible teaches that God created the material realm around us. He cares for his created environment, but it's here for us. It's here for us to make the decision where we want to spend eternity. In the meantime, we are forced to conclude there is a grand designer, the God of the Bible.